Okay, oh, here, oh my god, change in non-farm payrolls comes in at 339,000. That's a massive beat. Uh, uh, you've got, uh, we don't have the wage gain number yet. The unemployment rate, what the hell? Goes, it goes up to 3.7. How do you have, I mean, the participation rate must have, no. Labor force participation rate. Oh my god, what is it? What are these numbers? Labor force participation rate, 62.6. So that's a match on expectation. It's the same as the prior. The average hourly earnings are 0.3%, so it's a match. The average hourly earnings year over year are 4.3%, which is weak. Weaker than expected on the year over year number. What the heck? But your change in non form payroll is a, this insane beat of 339,000 versus 195. That's a 74% beat. But the unemployment rate actually goes up. The unemployment rate goes up from the prior of 3.4 or the expectation of 3.5 to 3.7 with a massive beat in the change in non-farm payrolls. I mean, like, now it's just like, what data is this even anymore? Like, what is happening? Is, is, is this like... Who's cooking the books, basically? <laughs> uh, this is quite bizarre. Uh, okay, so we'll go through the exact report uh, in just a detail in, in just a moment, but let's let's see what some of the initial things are here. Third whopper number of the year. At the start of 2023, economists were expecting the January jobs figure to come in at 189,000. We got a print of 517,000 instead. Here we go. Wow, another big surprise. Yeah, no kidding. But. At the same time, the jobs, the unemployment rate rises 0.3%. Is this the Fed's interpretation of, oh, the unemployment rate is going to go up while massive jobs are being created? What? <laughs> this is so weird. Uh, okay. So again, this is this is now the uh, uh, third crazy beat in a row. Let's try to understand what's actually in this report because this is quite bizarre. Non-farm payroll increased 339,000 in May. Uh, yeah, this is going to be tough for the Fed. Going to be hard to pause after such a big gain in payrolls. Uh, I don't know though. The average hourly earnings came in at forecast. Remember, I don't know that the Fed needs to cause unemployment. I think people keep thinking that. People keep thinking the Fed needs to cause unemployment. They don't. And in a weird way, they kind of just did cause unemployment by the unemployment rate going up 0.3%. This makes absolutely no sense at all. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, 339,000 jobs in May. The unemployment rate rose uh, rose 0.3 percentage points to 3.7%. I don't understand. Uh, we'll figure it out though. Uh, household data rose, uh, let's see, unemployment rate increased. Uh, okay, unemployed persons rose, oh, here you go. And the, in the household's data, so in the household's data, the number of unemployed people rose by 440,000. Okay, so that's interesting. So in the, in the payrolls data, you had a 330,000 gain. And in the household survey, you had a 440,000 job loss. Am I, am I to understand that correctly like this? We, we will get through the, the, the charts and they'll show us this in a little more detail. All right, unemployment rate for adult women, 3.3%, blacks, 5.6%, uh, adult men, 3.5%, whites, 3.3%, Asians, 2.9%, uh, Hispanics, 4%, little changed. Number of job losses and persons uh, completing temporary jobs increased uh, 318,000. Number of persons jobless less than five weeks edged up by 217,000. So, so if I'm to sort of put little negatives here, that's an increase right here. That's an increase right here. Uh, that's an increase right here. So you got some negative numbers, and these all seem to be on our household surveys data, which remember the, the payrolls data is calling businesses. So this is from the business point of view, which basically can double count people. So if you have multi jobs, you could get double counted in this survey, whereas over here, you don't get double counted. The two-year treasury yield, by the way, serving now. Oh, great. And April gets revised up. Hold on a sec. Let me look at this. This is, oh, yep, of course it does. Oh, wow. This is very fascinating. Okay, so change in non-farm payrolls for the last month goes from 253,000 to 294,000. So you get a revision up of how many jobs you had the last time. But then wait for this. You ready for this? the average hourly earnings of the last report actually went down from 0.5% to 
4%. So in other words, in May and April, we had weaker wage growth than expected. We just had more jobs than expected. That's, that's quite literally your Goldilocks scenario. It's quite literally going to make Jerome Powell very excited. Jerome Powell's gonna be like, Oh, I'm getting inflation down while people are getting more jobs. Oh, wow, wow, wow. I mean, come on. If you were the chairperson of the Federal Reserve, you'd be feeling the same way. You'd be like, I'm about to get a statue at Mount Rushmore. Uh, okay. Labor force participation rate didn't change, 62.6%. Number uh, of uh, persons employed part-time at 3.7. Uh, little change. Number of persons not in the labor force, 5.5 million. Little different. Uh, not attached was a little changed. Fine. Establishment survey. So here's your establishment survey. Total non-farm payroll increased 339,000 in May. That was the headline number we read off. Whereas we had those losses over in, uh, in the household. What do we have here? You've got in May, professional business services added 64,000 jobs, similar in April. Government employment, 56,000. Healthcare, 52,000. Leisure and hospitality, 48,000. Construction, 25,000. Transportation and warehousing, 24,000. Uh, that's actually surprising. Uh, let's see, couriers and messengers up, air transport up, uh, social services up. Employment little changed at other industries like mining, oil, gas, manufacturing, wholesale trade, retail trade. No, I see no losses here, at least in the uh, establishment survey. Average hourly earnings, here you go, 0.3%. That's actually really good. But both of these numbers, uh, I mean, the 0.3% the at expectations, the 4.3% slightly lower than expected. Uh, most Fed officials, crucially Powell, have been saying that they're ready to pause, perhaps skipping a rate hike. The whole skip is such BS. If they pause, they pause. I, I really don't believe this skip narrative. It, it doesn't make sense. You go back to the Arthur Burns reputation of start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. It's not what they're going to want to do. Yeah, wild. This is uh, 14 straight months, by the way, that payroll gains have beaten the median estimate. Wow, 14 straight months. Uh, and it's not the first time in a period that the number has beaten every single forecast. The highest forecast this cycle was 250,000. And 339,000 handily beat that, especially since the prior two months in total. So last month was revised up like 40,000 jobs or whatever. And the month before that was also revised. In total, those two months revised up 93,000 jobs. This is nutty. This is very, very wild. Uh, well, it's it's good, but it's just wild. It's just not what you would expect. Uh, let's get one of some of these tables up here so we could get a little bit detail. But oh my god, <laughs> this is insane. Okay, so let's look at uh, let's look at the households data. Um, I mean, it's good. It should be good. The market should be seeing this as a good thing. Yeah, uh, but we'll, we'll 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 look at just a moment. So here you have the household survey, household data, and you have uh, let's see here, employed. Wow, look at this! This is why the unemployment rate went up. So in the household survey, employed minus three hundred ten thousand, unemployed up four hundred forty thousand. So we have to think about this at the same time as, as wages aren't going up. So really, uh, that much. What's happening here is you're probably seeing, let's take a look here, household data, which again, reports on individuals. Individuals. Nobody really cares how you spell it. Kevin, just get to the point. Minus 339,000. Do I have that correct? Minus... Oh, 310,000. Okay, fine. Minus 310,000 jobs. That's the household data. The payroll or, or the establishment survey reports on businesses. That's kind of like, yo, business, how many, how many people you got on payroll? That actually shot up by 339,000. And then the number of unemployed shot up by 440,000. So this is soft, uh, right? So Fed working, 
This is soft, fed, working. This is stupid. And then, <laughs> and then the 0.3% uh, wage gain month over month is good. The 0.4 or the, sorry, the 4.3% year over year is lower than expected. And last month, months, month over month, went down from 0.5 to 0.4%. And like, I don't suppose I would argue that the data is rigged, but I suppose if I were going to rig the data, it would look something just like this. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, wow. Very interesting. Uh, so, uh, let's see here. Job gains have averaged 314,000 this year, 470,000 since 2020. In the 10 years before the pandemic, employers added about 187,000 on average. So this is the 14th straight beat on average since, what, what, what is this? On average since uh, blah, 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 pandemic, or average, 10 years since pandemic, 10 years prior to pandemic, 187K average. Wow, this is remarkable. Now I'm curious to see what ge what effect this actually has on uh, on some of our markets. So, well, let's look at exactly that. We have here's your Nasdaq. Look at that volume first of all coming in right here. Uh, as the data comes out, at first you get this massive dump, and then you get a recovery, and then you get a dump again. So you're at about 0.3 percent. You're down about 15 basis points from where you were before the report on the Nasdaq. If you look at the SPY, you're at 422. You're at a FIBI level. The SPY is basically like, oh my God, this is terribly great. The SPY is actually up like eight basis points. Uh, Tesla's up 1.3%. You've got uh, uh, Okta, uh, you know, up 1.3% after that like minus 20% day it had uh, yesterday. Yeah, okay, minus 17.8%. C3AI is up 13. Point. Uh, or down 13% yesterday, down another 2% today. What's this? Carvana, crazy, like 22% yesterday. Redfin, 6% yesterday. NVIDIA, 5% yesterday. Up 0.8% uh, here in pre-market. Uh, Embraer was up 4% yesterday. Wow, okay. So what about uh, DJI? Every time I type DJI for Dow Jones Industrial, I'm like, Drones? <laughs> uh, okay, fascinating. So uh, let's let's now let me see what else Wall Street is saying here. Um, other than Kevin still needs to raise the prices on the courses, so you still have a few hours left of checking out on any of those programs, or send us an email. Uh, we've already caught up on all the emails, but if, so if you wanted to f fill the team up again, you could do that. Email us at staff at mekevin.com, but I will get it taken care of. Uh, after I after I get my work done uh, this morning. So anyway, Bureau of Labor Statistics notes that employment gains in May came in these sectors: business services, government, healthcare, construction. We already went through that. Uh, okay, what is this? Here's an industry breakdown. Of the, I don't really care about that. That's we already went through. That's stupid. I don't care. Uh, okay. Oh, Treasuries. So what's going on with Treasuries? And then we need to see in, in a moment. Uh, what's going on with a five-year break-even. The five-year break-even lags a little bit, so we'll, we'll go to that in, in, in probably a few minutes, but uh, it's, just, it's, just, it's just, this is just insane. Um, okay, so treasury yields technically up a little bit. I mean, like, the 10-year treasury is up like four bips. Who cares? It's at 3.64%. The treasury yields, in a weird way, are actually popping. They're, they're, they were trying to pop off a little bit. We don't know if that'll actually hold, but I, I can't say that like a four bit rise on the 10 year treasury is that big of a deal. It looks like a big deal, but that's because I'm looking at a day chart and I'm literally looking at a chart going from 3.61 to 3.64, like who cares? <laughs> so, so that's not a big deal. <laughs> this is so weird. This is quite bizarre. I, I, what, what are they saying here? I mean, I wonder if they're just equally confused. Oh, 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 the second I go to them, they go to commercial. <laughs> Yo, blast on. <laughs> okay, let's try Bloomberg then. Weird. Areas of the economy in terms of hiring, that's a little bit worrisome for the Fed and the inflation because all the disinflation is coming from the goods. And so if goods prices are stabilizing and goods hiring is increasing, which is what we see in this report, 
then you know you may have the consensus outlook here, which is focused on these NAPM surveys, the PMIs, we got it earlier, the ISMs, you know, collapsing into recession levels. That may just be a nominal effect. Uh, yeah, well, and that's also true. That's the big thing. It's like, this is not a recessionary level. Igor, Igor Zegoluski says he has the answer. Okay, you ready for Igor Zegoluski? Uh, his answer? He's an is this Russian disinformation? Okay, Igor says people who work from home are getting two jobs on paycheck and productivity is zero. That's why we have this nonsense. Payroll up, unemployment up. Hilarious. I mean, you're not wrong. In fact, there are, there are some people who will get a remote job and then they'll get another remote job and they basically get another remote job and they make it their job to get as many remote jobs as possible and they'll sit there and have four or five remote jobs. This happened a lot during the pandemic. And they basically won't even work. They'll just wait to get fired. And as they wait to get fired, they're collecting the paycheck. And then it takes the companies like four or five months to realize that remote worker isn't actually performing their duties. And then they get fired. But in the meantime, they just got paid five jobs like for five months. And then they just kind of keep adding a new job at the end. So yeah. To some extent, remote work uh, has has some catching up to do with with how we count it. Uh, so so you're not wrong, uh, e Igor. Uh, so uh, but Igor says this is very bearish. Uh, so and then Gary Roberts says Igor is a bot, and not Steve says Igor is Polish, not Russian. Okay, whatever. I I guess the the point is. Uh, we got to look at the five five year break even. A, we'll just pull that up really quick. Uh, but the point is, however you measure it, uh, as as weird and as rigged it feels, it's very hard to look at it and say with certainty it's a hundred percent bearish. Like even if people are working two jobs, uh, it, fine. Uh, then then uh, but then again. It, it, you know, like, like I say, either way you look at it, it's like if you take out the multi-counting, then the Fed's job is working, right? If you take out the multi-counting by looking at the household survey, well, then the Fed just destroyed 330,000 jobs or 310,000, yeah, 310,000 jobs. So if you want to look at no multi-counting, the Fed just destroyed 310,000 jobs. So the Fed's doing a good job. If you want to look at the Fed avoiding a recession, well, then, then you could cite the payrolls report and go, the Fed just created 339,000 jobs. And then if you want to look at inflation, which is the important one, you look and go, inflation for wages are right at expectations and actually came in softer for the year over year and the month over month last month. You had a revision. <laughs> the five-year break even is like, I don't know what to think of this. Here's the five-year break-even, which just ticked up from 2.08. But, dude, look at the trend. <laughs> like, yeah, really? Do we really care that the five-year break-even just ticked up four basis points? No. It, it is volatile. It has its little, you know, five to 20-point moves all the time. You just want to pay attention to it to make sure it doesn't unanchor. See, and that's, that's the big thing that regularly I would argue that everybody misses when it comes to, okay, Igor wants you to know he's Macedonian, not Polish or Russian. It's exactly what a Russian would say. <laughs> Sorry. But anyway, uh, so the, the big thing that, the, that, that essentially people are missing about the Fed is this idea that, oh, well, well, the Fed has to get inflation down faster. And that's still above... 2% Kevin. No. What is the historical precedent of the Fed getting inflation down? Well, the historical precedent of the Fed getting inflation down is let's wait 20 years to get inflation down. That's what they did. After we got Paul Volcker, they waited 20 freaking years to get inflation down. So in that case, as long as inflation expectations are stable, the Fed's in no rush. And Jerome Powell could be like, I will have my tea and crumpets and be happy because I'm getting a building or a Mount Rushmore or something dedicated to me. Mm -hmm. 
This, by the way, is a massive Batman cup. Uh, what's kind of cool about it is it's got this really, like, badass handle right here. The only downside is when I hold that badass handle, you can't see it anymore. <laughs> then again, you know it's there. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, look, I know people say they're like, oh, but Kevin, you just, you just always have a bullish bias. No, I don't. It was, certainly wasn't bullish about Rivian or the market. <laughs> um, but this isn't that bad. From the biggest, the most important thing that came out of this report, in my opinion, was the wage gro uh, uh, growth. Because we do not want to see an inflation or wage price spiral. Remember what got me to flip-flop in the first place. If you go all the way back to the first flip-flop, Jan 2022, it was a wage price spiral. Nobody's talking about a wage price spiral anymore. Literally, nobody is talking about a wage price spiral. Why is nobody talking about a wage price spiral? Because there is no wage price spiral. If anything, there's like a deflationary wage price spiral potentially going to happen because of AI. Like if you're not learning AI, you're getting left behind. That's why we're releasing all the AI lectures on June 6th at 6 p.m. Macy's, this was entertaining. I tweeted this part yesterday, but I want to point it out. Uh, yesterday, we, we were going through uh, some of retail's earnings calls in the course member live stream just to check what inflation is doing. That's what we do. We looked at Nordstrom. We looked at Macy's. You look at their earnings. You look at their earnings calls. We do this every day. We try to do fundamental analysis every single day the market is open. And Macy's, listen to what I wrote on the tweeters. You ready for this? You can look at my beautiful little yellow check mark. Isn't that nice? It's for a team. It's beautiful. It's shiny. It doesn't matter. Okay, so here. Macy's is literally trying to convince investors the markdowns and massive price reductions happening in stores are just following, quote, you ready for this? Here's, here's Macy's explanation for markdowns and massive price reductions. Quote, we are following our enhanced pricing algorithms. We are following our pricing science tools. We are conducting promotions with precision. And we are simply updating our marketing messaging. In other words, our pricing is very robust. No, it's not. These are all euphemisms for we suck and prices are going down. But this is exactly what you would tell an investor in your earnings call because Macy's thinks you're stupid and thinks you're going to go, oh, oh yeah, you're dropping prices because you have enhanced pricing algorithms. Why don't you just come out and say you have AI to tell you you need to drop prices? Because you know what? That would just make us really happy you're dropping prices. <laughs> the inflation's going away. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. So uh, somebody here writes, uh, Business Insider blamed AI for the uh, people laid off. Uh, maybe. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, then, uh, yeah, there's, there's no inflation going to the moon. Why is the bond market moving higher? So why would the bond market move higher on this? The bond market would, would move higher on this because the initial impression is that, oh, well, this means the Fed is going to have to keep rates higher for longer. Maybe not necessarily higher, but at least for longer. And the longer rates are up, the more uh, uh, people end up... Uh, you know, uh, the, the more you end up seeing bonds get dumped, and then when bonds get dumped, the price of those bonds go down, and the yields go up. In other words, what you have to be compensated to stick your money into stupid bonds has to go up. The only reason you should put your money into bonds is if you really need the cash for something. Like, you're gonna go shopping for real estate. There's no way in hell if you're gonna go shopping for real estate, you should really probably be speculating on, you know, YOLO calls or the stock market, because you just don't know. Uh, or, you know, but otherwise, your opportunity cost is massive to sit there and, you know, oh, I'm making 5%. Fine. 
Uh, but uh, in addition to, to this explanation for why yields are going up, if you look at now the uh, futures rate monitor, yesterday, after the Fed leak that we were going to see uh, a pause, you got this. Yesterday, we were at a 77% chance of a pause. After today's data, you're actually at a 66.9% chance of a pause. Fascinating. <laughs> Steve says, Macy says, AI, so it must be good. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a really interesting idea. Take these phrases, enhance pricing algorithms and such, put them into ChatGPT and see what it thinks. Hey, ChatGPT, if a company used the following phrases to discuss price reductions and markdowns, are they trying to make investors feel good or uh, uh, while, while actually facing uh, a lack of pricing power? Or how should I interpret these phrases from Macy's in an investor earnings call. Paste. Okay, let's just see what it says to Gazo. These phrases are certainly trying to cast the company's pricing strategies in a positive light, as they tend to do in earnings calls. <laughs> Each of them indicates a different aspect of their pricing and marketing strategies. Enhanced pricing algorithms. This implies the company is using advanced technology or data-driven methods to determine optimal pricing. It deter oh, look at that. It suggests they're using AI <laughs> to adjust prices. Okay. Uh, it could be about increasing prices where the market will bear it. Ooh, ooh, oh, you're saying there's hope. Pricing science tools is another way of saying they're using analytical methods to determine pricing. Promotions and precisions suggest their sales and promotions are targeted based on the data of consumer behaviors. Yeah, but all of this should be the default anyway. Updating marketing messages seems to indicate they're changing the way they communicate about their prices and promotions to customers. This, they may be trying to emphasize value. Well, that's exactly what everyone does when pricing is going down. While these phrases do suggest the company is using more sophisticated methods to set prices, they do not necessarily mean the company is facing a lack of pricing power. Yeah, I disagree, but okay. It could be that they're trying to use these methods to maximize profits in a competitive market. However, if these phrases are being used in conjunction with the news of lower than expected profits or revenue, yes, Macy's just dumped, or if the company is generally struggling, struggling the company just dumped, it could indeed be an attempt to make a bad situation seem better. <laughs> oh, that's actually kind of hilarious. I, this is what I like about the, the chat GPT. I feel like you're almost kind of getting like your, your uh, it's like an unbiased friend who's like, well, it could be this, it could be that. The only downside is, is like, well, which is it? <laughs> anyway, very cool. So, um, there's the jobs data for you. Very fascinating. And uh, now let's uh, let's go chat about uh, I don't know something else. Uh, we can listen to CNBC for a second. We're gonna I want to jump into uh, a, a very interesting piece about uh, talking about hi the history of artificial intelligence from but but for, or innovation from a way of what does it do to the economy and what does it do to jobs. It's actually a really fascinating piece. So we'll go into that in just a moment. Uh, do keep in mind uh, after we get our work done this morning, uh, we got to raise those prices on the programs on building your wealth. Uh, or the uh, increasing your income course, uh, whether you're an employee or you're um, working for yourself, you're an entrepreneur, you want to see how to use AI actually productively in your business. You don't want to just get inundated with a stupid list of tools, but you actually want to see how can a, a real entrepreneur who faces real entrepreneurial challenges actually use artificial intelligence in their daily lives to be a better entrepreneur or employee. And that's what the how to make more money and get SH90 done faster courses for. And then of course, it, all of these come with lifetime access to the course member live streams and the updates that we do to them in the future. So check those out, link down below. We'll get that done. We are caught up on emails, but if you want to email us, head one to uh, staff at meetkevin.com. Now I want you to know this, when it comes to AI, time is what's going to make you money. And if you can prove that value to an employer, you'll always be able to be employed. So this is another way of making sure that you don't get replaced.